right? That's all. That's all I'm saying. No, I mean, uh, you know what? Like math and physics is so cool. I mean, it depends on, on your physics, right? Like I think, for example, I hated classical mechanics as a general rule. It gets kind of cool when you get into like Lagrangian mechanics and Hamiltonian mechanics, but like basic classical mechanics is really dumb. I hate it. Um, and, you know, all the stupid, like you got a block on a, on a slope and friction and uh, to hell with all that. That stuff's not interesting. Uh, and even to some extent, electromagnetism, I'm not particularly interested in. There's some cool stuff there, but a lot of it is boring. Um, but when you get into the really high level stuff, like high energy physics, quantum mechanics, particle physics, uh, it's all math, right? The line between mathematics and physics becomes extremely thin. Uh, and there really is no difference between doing the math and the physics, right? Uh, I've explained this to, I don't think I've explained it in this class, but for example, actually, I, and I did this as my job talk, um, that the, the fact you, guys, you all may have heard, right, with electrons, if you take an electron and you spin it around 360 degrees, uh, the electron flips upside down. Did you guys know that, right? So if you take an electron and you flip it 360 degrees, it flips upside down. And then you have to flip it another 360 degrees to flip it back the original way that it came up. And the reason for that is because you have this thing, um, o basically it comes up as being O3, or SU2 is a double cover of O3. And so this, this is all math, right? SU2 is a double cover of O3. And then when you take the irreducible representations of both of these things, um, that actually gives you the spin structure of the electron. And that's all mathematics, right? Everything I said there probably sounded crazy to you, but that's all math. Um, so being able to figure out why that happens is a math thing. And some of you may have heard of the Pauli exclusion principle. Does anyone know the Pauli exclusion principle? Right, well, okay, what is, what is the Pauli exclusion principle? Just roughly, right? You don't have to like be precise. Yeah, yeah, it's an algebra thing. It's in particular though, it's a Lie, Lie group and Lie algebra thing. Right, exactly. So two uh, electrons, and more generally, if you wanna extend the Pauli exclusion principle to fermions, uh, of which electrons are a type, right? Electrons are a type of fermion. Two fermions can't have the same uh, quantum numbers. They can't occupy the same position in an orbital shell. Now, bosons don't have this issue. Protons can absolutely occupy simultaneous space. Um, uh, like, you know, protons don't tend to be in the shell anyway, but basically you can't have two electrons stack on top of each other, right? And if you've taken like high school chemistry, you probably learned this fact. And there, you know, you might say, well, like, why is this? What's the mathematical consequence? What, why is this true? And it comes down to linear independence. So if for any of you taking linear algebra, if you've learned about linear independence yet, it's basically electrons are not allowed to be linearly dependent. And if you're in the same shell, if you have the same quantum number, you certainly are linearly dependent. Bosons don't have that restriction. And so the actual proof that electrons um, are basically what are called these uh, anti-symmetric uh, or yeah, these alternating tensors um, is the fact that they satisfy Fermi-Dirac statistics in their quantum field. Uh, and so this naturally makes them um, alternating and alternating things can't be linearly dependent. So that's the Pauli exclusion principle from a math perspective. Now you need a lot more math in order to be able to get there. But at the end of the day, it all becomes the same thing, right? Math and, and physics, same thing at the highest level. It's very, very cool, right? But you got a lot more math to get to before you get there. And some of it is this math. So maybe we should, maybe I should, I should do some of this math, right? But no, it's very cool. Uh, and if any of you, if you hate physics, like I hated physics in first and second year, right? I took a lot of it. Um, but then I went back and started doing it a lot more in, in upper years. And especially once I had more math, and if you know the math, physics is very easy. Uh, I don't want to say very easy. That's not fair. But the hardest thing about math, uh, physics is when you're in second year physics, you're using third year math that you haven't taken yet. When you're in third year physics, you're using fourth year math that you haven't learned yet. Um, so if you actually do the math and then go back and do the physics, it's much, much easier. Uh, and it gives you the kind of this nice uh, advantage over the physicist. And it's lots, like I said, if you like math, you will like physics. It's lots of cool stuff. All right, so you might want to give that a shot. Okay, 
So today, basically, we're going to prove a bunch of things about limits um, and then eventually kind of segue into continuity. But of course, that'll be after the break because, you know, this is reading week after this week. So the first thing that we're going to learn, limits are unique. Limits, I should say, if they exist, are unique. Okay, so that is, maybe let me phrase this mathematically, because that's kind of the plain English way of saying things. If you're, I were to actually phrase this mathematically, I'd say, uh, if the limit as x approaches c, f of x exists, and the limit is equal to L and M, then L has to be equal to M. Right? So that's one way of saying uniqueness. Uh, you say, listen, if you give me two values of the limit, actually they had to be the same value, right? They can't actually be different numbers. So there's lots of proofs of this. There's lots of different things you can do. Spivak gives one proof. Uh, my book, it, there's another one. I think mine and Spivak's are pretty close. I actually want to take a different approach today just to, I mean, the approach is, I think, in some sense, is easier, but requires that you be able to make a logical jump. And if you're not okay with this logical jump, it is a fun little proof just to convince yourself of. Okay. So what I'm going to do, and the logical thing that we need to get past, let me start by explaining that. The logical thing is we have to convince ourselves So let's say convince yourself that if the absolute value of A is less than epsilon for all epsilon, what do we know about A? So fx has to be injective for a limit to exist? No, no, no. This looks kind of like the condition of injectivity because we said if the two limits are equal, then their limits are equal. Um, but that's not that's not quite what I'm saying here. I'm saying if you gave me uh, a limit of the function f and you told me, uh, and exactly, yeah, Tehran and Ilya, uh, the a has to be zero. But what I'm saying is if you gave me the value of the limit, you said it was L, and then doing some other computation, you did you computed the limit a different way and you got a uh, different number that you called m. In fact, L and m had to be the same number because there's only one limit, right? Limits exist, uh, or when the limit exists, it is unique. Right, so it's not an injectivity statement because we don't know about anything that's happening away from the the limiting point. It's just a statement that the limits have to be the same. Okay, so exactly uh, then a is equal to zero. Okay, now the the reason to see this is the what's basically when we look at the statement the absolute value of a is less than epsilon, we're saying that whatever the absolute value of a is, it's smaller than every other positive number. Right. So it can't be negative because absolute values can't be negative. And it's smaller than every positive number. Well, there's only one number that can possibly do that, right? And that's the number zero. Now, if you want to do a formal proof of this, I would encourage you to do it. It's very quick. I would probably do it by contradiction. Um, that's probably the easiest way to do it. But just go do like uh, convince yourself on your own. It's like a 10 second proof for the sake of contradiction. Assume A is not zero. Oh, look, I can make an epsilon smaller than A contradiction. Right? So we're going to use this fact. If the absolute value of A is less than epsilon for all epsilon, then A is equal to zero. Okay, so we also know that uh, the limit of f of x is equal to L and the limit of f of x is equal to M. So uh, fix some epsilon greater than zero. And I want to really point out here how my interaction with um, with the limit has changed. And let me just write this out and I'll explain why, because it'll help if I have it in front of me. Such that if x minus c is less than delta 1,
then f of x minus m. Maybe let's make it epsilon over two. Okay. So when I say my relationship with the epsilon delta proof or with the limit has changed, what I mean by this is the following. Here, I've used the fact that the limit of f of x equals L and the limit of f of x equals M. In fact, you know what? Maybe let me put a little one here and a little two here. So this is statement one and this is statement two. I'm not trying to prove that these limits exist. I already know that they exist, which means that now I can give it an epsilon and it produces me a delta, okay? My, like, uh, okay, let me phrase it this way. When you're trying to prove that a limit exists, you're, uh, it's like you're on one side of a counter from somebody else, right? And what's gonna happen is when you're trying to prove a limit exists, you're trying to show that no matter what epsilon they give you, you're the one receiving the epsilons, you're gonna compute a delta and you're gonna hand the delta back, right? So that's what happens when you're trying to prove that a limit exists. Somebody gives you an epsilon, you figure out what the appropriate delta is and you hand the delta back. When you know that a limit exists, that interaction, that relationship actually flips. You are now allowed to give the limit an epsilon and it will compute for you a delta and hand you the delta back. You might not know what the delta is, but you can be guaranteed it exists, right? So now, again, I'm not trying to prove the limit exists, now I know that the limit exists, so I can give it an epsilon and I can get a delta back. And that's what I've done here, right? I know the limit of f of x uh, is equal to L. I also know the limit of f of x is equal to M. So I'm gonna hand it an epsilon that I just chose arbitrarily. I said, fix some epsilon greater than zero. I handed it an epsilon and I got back delta one and delta two, right? I don't have to figure them out because I know the limits exist already. Does that make sense? Is everyone okay with that like uh, reversing of this relationship? Right, hopefully, but okay. And you know, yell out if something doesn't make sense, but your relationship to the limit has changed. Okay, so uh, so we know that this is true. So now what I'm gonna do is I want both of these things to be true at, at the same time. Wait, why divided by 200? Uh, no, I'm still, <laughs> right, why two? Because I know, uh, yeah, somehow those zeros snuck in there. Uh, it should be uh, obvious in a second, but let's assume we took them out, right? So let's take out the epsilon over twos for now, and then we can fix that later, right? Same sort of thing. If you were writing this on a test, you could fix your epsilons at the end. So let's just say left slim epsilon for now. And basically what I'm going for is I want to show that the absolute value of L minus M is less than epsilon, because that will give me my result, right? So I want to show, oops, not blue. Right, so this is what I'm going for. Because if I can show that this is true for all epsilon, then L must have been equal to M, right? Based off of my statement above, right? The thing inside the absolute values would have to be equal to zero. Therefore, L would have to be equal to M. So that's what I'm trying to do. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the standard little trick here where I add and subtract, right? I'm saying, okay, what do I, what do I know? I know something about F of X minus L and I know something about F of X minus M. I need to make f of x show up, right? In order to be able to say anything about that. So what we're gonna do is let's add it and subtract it, right? And then I'm gonna triangle inequality it. Right, and voila, now I know the, something about these two. Can I explain why? Uh, I, yeah, sure, okay. So uh, based off of this sentence, right? Exactly. So we're trying to show that L is equal to M. And so if I can show that, right, then that will imply that L minus M is equal to zero, and that will give us the result. Does that make sense? Right? Okay, perfect. And so now I get less than epsilon plus epsilon. And here's where I'd say, okay, I actually want it to work out perfectly. I've got two epsilons here. It's again, it's not a big deal. If you do your proof and you get two epsilon, that's totally okay. But I'm kind of, you know, nitpicky about making sure I get my epsilons. So I'm going to make them epsilon over two, just so that everything works out like so, right? So that's we've shown 
Since epsilon was chosen arbitrarily, this must be true for all epsilon. All right, since epsilon greater than zero was arbitrary, L minus M is less than epsilon for all epsilon. And hence, L is equal to M. Right, so the limit is unique. And you can see that like, when it's all written out, that is relatively long, but the idea is not terribly hard, right? And in fact, the way I like to, the way I did this in the book is actually the way I kind of like a little bit more, which is to go by contradiction, but really you should avoid contradiction whenever you can. Here the contradiction proof is built into the, the statement that is uh, in the blue rectangle at the top, right? So it's kind of hidden inside of there, but generally speaking, you should try and avoid contradiction if you can, just because again, there are some mathematicians out there who are really upset about it. Um, so try to avoid it if you don't have to use it. And especially as when you start to get good with contradiction, students tend to overuse it. They try and use it for everything, even when they can prove it directly. Um, and we'll often like prove it directly and then say, oh, look, I got a contradiction because I proved it directly. Uh, so you want to try and avoid that. But another thing to do is say, suppose L is not equal to M and then derive a contradiction. And that's what I do in, in the book. And so you can check that out uh, if you want or even better, try and do it yourself, right? Draw a picture, say, well, what happens if I have two different values of the limit? And be like, oh, look, I can put a little epsilon ball around both that don't, that don't overlap each other, but somehow the function's gotta be in both of those epsilon bands at the same time, and that's not possible, right? That'll give you a contradiction. So if you wanna do it that way, you absolutely can. Nice little practice for you. Okay, so limits are unique. That's just a nice sanity check. I think you probably knew that already, but now we know for sure. Right. Uh, let's do another one. Uh, what do I want to say here? There's a neighborhood. Okay, sure. So proposition. So suppose uh, the limit as x approaches c f of x equals l exists. Right, I haven't said what the function is, but we know implicitly if I say this function exists, it's defined in a deleted open interval around C, yada, 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 right? Then there exists uh, an interval. Or maybe let me say, uh, and f of c is defined just to make our lives easier. It's not necessary, but just make our lives easier. We can choose epsilon over 2 because we know the function has limit. So whatever epsilon we choose, there will be a delta. Exactly, Stephen. Exactly. And you, so you can put any epsilon that you want there, and you'll get a delta out. I happen to use epsilon over 2 for some epsilon that was chosen previously. But yeah, I can use any epsilon I want, and that's the one that I chose. Exactly. <coughs> Excuse me. And f of c is defined, then there exists uh, some row greater than zero such that f is bounded on c minus rho, c plus rho. Okay. So I'll let you read that for a second and think about what it's trying to say. And again, this might seem obvious, but it's okay because if something's obvious, then you should be able to prove that it's obvious, right? So what I'm saying here is that if the limit exists, then the function must be bounded nearby right? At least some, like you might have to make this neighborhood really, really small, uh, but it's fine. You can find some open interval containing your point C on which your function is bounded, right? So your function can't be unbounded near the, the, the limiting point. Does that make sense? Does everyone understand what this is trying to say? 
It doesn't, no, yeah, it doesn't say that the values around that, it does in the sense that implicitly already, when we say that the limit uh, of f of x is equal to L, we're already saying that the function has values which exist around the point C, right? So we know that the function is defined around C, that's okay. But what we're saying is that the function doesn't explode at C, right? Yeah, sure, let me kind of give you an example then just as a simple thing. So let's take, say, example. So let's say I tell you the limit as x approaches, I don't know, uh, one tenth of the function one over x squared is equal to what, 100, right? It's not quite continuity yet, but so you all agree that as x approaches zero, this number gets really, really big, right? Because I'm dividing by a really, really small number, so the number is going to get very, very big. If I were to actually graph this now, right, and let's just kind of look at what's happening on the right. So my function, right, explodes and is actually unbounded at zero, right? There's no interval containing zero in which the function is bounded. Do you all agree? Right? If I ever do an interval around zero, the function is shooting off, is getting arbitrarily big in the interval around zero. But if I choose the point, let's say this is the point one here, and this is my limiting point one tenth. If I choose a really small neighborhood, in this case, a neighborhood that doesn't include the number zero, then yeah, my function is actually bounded. Right, My function maybe looks like that on this neighborhood, right? And as I get closer and closer to zero, but I'm not equal to zero, even though this limit keeps getting bigger and I keep getting closer and closer to zero, I can still always find a little interval in which the function stays bounded, right? It's only if my interval contains zero that I'm in trouble. So does that make sense? Right, I'm saying, yeah, that interval might get really, really damn small, right? If I took a limit as X approached one over a million, then in order to avoid the bad point, the point at zero, my interval has to be really, really, really small. But I can always do that, that's fine, right? It's just zero is the bad point. But at zero, the limit doesn't exist anyway. So as long as the limit exists, you're guaranteed that your function is bounded on some sufficiently small interval. Is that okay? Right, so I mean that's part of it. We're gonna we're gonna do we're gonna figure out how we find rho. And is that bound L plus epsilon L minus epsilon? Effectively, Junjun. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm gonna say let's be a little bit more precise about like what epsilon we choose because again we know the limit exists, so we can choose epsilon. But exactly, that's basically the idea. Can we choose rho to be delta when epsilon is very small? Yeah, absolutely. Right. So I think great. Like a lot of you have figured out what you what we sort of want to say, because, again, we know that the function has to live in this epsilon band. Right. And that epsilon band is exactly the bounds. Right. It guarantees that our function is bounded because it, it has to live inside of that epsilon band. So absolutely. Now, what you want to do, though, is when you're trying to actually get a solid bound and, and show that your function is bounded. It helps to actually pick an epsilon. So I think you, many of you have gotten this right idea about choosing, you know, rho to be delta and epsilon, you know, um, kind of generically. But the thing is, we can choose epsilon, right? So what I'm going to say is, as a proof, all right. So set epsilon to be equal to one. I of course could set it to anything, but one's a nice number. Uh, so that, or let's say, and let delta be such that if zero is less than x minus c is less than delta, then f of x minus l is less than epsilon. And uh, as you pointed out, Stephen, right, I'm probably just going to take rho to be equal to delta here. So note, so taking rho is equal to delta, we have that, so if you expand this out, right, if you write what the absolute value of fx minus l less than epsilon mean, that means that l minus epsilon is less than f of x. 
is less than L plus epsilon for all X in C minus delta union, uh, oops, C minus delta C union C, C plus delta. Now, this isn't quite what I wanted, right? Because I said, if you look at the theorem statement, maybe let me just zoom out here. I want it to be on the whole interval, C minus rho to C plus rho. So if I said delta B equal to rho, I'm in a good place here. Now, this is why I said in the very beginning, just suppose that F of C is defined so that, you know, we don't have to worry about the, there being this hole here. Is there any way, right, that, or sorry, uh, I'm not using epsilon, I'm using one. L minus one to L plus one. Okay, now is there any way if f of c is defined that it could break boundedness? Right? Like I know that my function is bounded from c minus delta to c plus delta, except possibly at the one point c, but, but the function is defined at c. So could that one point somehow make me unbounded? Yeah, but no matter how big it is, it's still finite, right? It can't go off to infinity. So even if it was like this nasty hole that an F of C was like 10 billion, that's fine. 10 billion is still bounded, right? Like no matter how big it is, it can't go off to infinity because an F of C wouldn't be defined, right? Okay, so uh, exactly. One point just can't pop off to infinity, right? So can anyone tell me now, I want to show that my function is bounded. I've almost got it, right? I know that f of x is between l minus 1 and l plus 1. But if I want to say it's truly bounded, I need to account for f of c. So what I'm going to say is set m to be the max of the absolute value of l minus 1, the absolute value of l plus 1, and f of c. so that the absolute value of f of x is less than or equal to m for all x in c minus delta, c plus delta, okay? So if I were to like draw this picture here again, um, all right, so the idea here is that maybe there's a hole at, one tenth, and that the actual value of the function is bigger than the bound that you had, then all you have to do is say, okay, well, extend the bound to include the value of f of c if you have to, right? If f of c is bigger than the l minus one and the l plus one, then just extend what our bounding uh, number is to include f of c, right? Just to make sure that I actually am bounded everywhere in that interval. And the function didn't say, right? The theorem doesn't say it has to be a good bound, just that it has to be a bound. Uh, and so we do have that. So does that make sense? Does everyone see why I had to do that last step as well? Right? And it feels a little pedantic because you could just say, listen, if we removed the point C and restated the theorem, then we wouldn't have to do that. And absolutely that's correct. Right, if you remove the point C, you don't have to worry about it at all. But I don't think that this is much extra work to be able to make to be able to make a statement which is slightly stronger. Right, so that's sort of the idea there. If C is infinite, then C is not defined. Uh, right, so you mean if we're taking a limit as x goes to infinity? Um, yeah, I mean infinity isn't a real number. And same thing, if you prove that your limit is infinite, that's also not existing, right? So if the limit goes off to infinity, we will not say the limit exists. It just fails to exist in a very special way, right? Um, yeah, so just as kind of a side note, so as a comment, if the limit as x approaches anything could be infinity or a finite number, if this is equal to infinity, the limit does not exist. Okay, it just fails to exist in a very particular way.
So in this case, right, obviously this, uh, this theorem would break in this case, right? But that's fine, doesn't, we didn't break math because this limit doesn't exist. Uh, in the max statement shouldn't, uh, you're right. Yeah, this should be in absolute values as well. Yeah. Okay. Now, out of curiosity, can anyone give me an example of a function which is nowhere locally bounded? Okay. This is just kind of a bonus question. It's not really, well, it's going to be related to what we do later. So kind of like a bonus thing. Uh, can you think? And I'll explain what locally bounded means. Of a function. Which is nowhere locally bounded. Okay. One over sine x though is locally bounded at all points except the roots of sine x, i.e., the integer multiples of pi. Right. So let me, yeah, let me explain. So a function is locally bounded. So uh, a function f from, let's just say, some domain d to r is locally bounded if for every x in the domain, there exists some, let's say, rho greater than 0. Such that f is bounded on x minus rho, x plus rho. Okay, so uh, and a function therefore is nowhere locally bounded if it's not bounded at any. It's not locally bounded for any of its values. I guess I should say a function f is locally bounded. Let's say at x and d instead of for all x and d. So that way it's a local property. So at x in d. And then we would say it's locally bounded on its whole domain if it's true for every point in its domain, right? So a function is locally bounded at a point if there's some interval in which the function is bounded. So the previous theorem or the previous proposition just said, if the limit exists, then your function is locally bounded at that limiting point, right? So now what I want is a function which is nowhere locally bounded. So Divyanch, absolutely, you give an example of a function which fails to be locally bounded at the integer multiples of pi, right? Because in those cases, you get like a one over zero and your function explodes. So you get a bunch of these, you know, vertical asymptotes that occur, you know, at pi, two pi, whatever the case might be. But the question is, can you find a function which is nowhere locally bounded? A function that on every interval around every point uh, the, the function that fails to be bounded, but exists, right? So you, you can't take a function that's equal to infinity everywhere. Yeah, no, see, that's not, that's not a function though, right, Yvonne? Like you're not allowed to take one over zero. Yeah, f of x has to be a real number for every x. So what is a function that is nowhere locally bounded? Uh, sine one over X, though, sine is always bounded between negative one and one, right? So even though that function Divyanch oscillates infinitely quickly, it is actually bounded. Okay, I'm gonna let you think about this. Basically, what you need is in every single interval, the, there's some point which uh, in that interval, which go, gets as arbitrarily big as you want it to be, okay? This is going to be an important theorem because actually the reciprocal of the, the there's an there's in some sense a, a natural function to choose and the reciprocal of that function is something we're going to see a lot. Um, so I want you to think about this and see if you can, you know, come up with something. 
But again, no, Ivan, it's got to be a real number. F of X has to be a real number. So you can't set it to be infinity, right? One over zero is not well-defined. You don't even know if it's positive infinity or negative infinity. So the output has to be a real number. So you're not allowed to do one over zero. It has to be a real output, right? It's a good idea though. You're very, very close, very close. You've got the right idea. Okay, and then let me see. All right, so this is a theorem. And I'm certain most of you have seen this before, but you probably didn't prove it. The limit laws. All right, now this takes a little bit to set up, right? There's a lot of things that we have to say. Suppose F and G uh, are defined in a deleted open of a point C. And both limits exist. Denominator of x is if x is rational. Yes, Ivan, I think. Yeah, you're getting on the right track there. And both, and to answer the um, Sultan's kind of uh, point here, remember, you can choose the domain, right? So you could actually choose a domain which doesn't include zero, and that would work. Okay, but Ivan, yeah, I think your answer works. You might want to prove it though now, right? So prove prove your thing works. And again, make sure you choose a domain that doesn't include zero because Sultan's um, contention with your example does work, right? What would you do with zero? I mean, you could just map it to zero if you really wanted to. Okay, so we've got two functions, f and g. We're told both of their limits exist. So one, there's going to be four parts to this for every alpha in R, the limit of alpha f of x is equal to alpha l, right? So basically you can take the alpha, the scalar multiple alpha, you can take it outside of the limit. The limit of the sums is the sum of the limits. L plus m like that. Same thing with the product. Limit as x approaches c, f of x times g of x is l times m, and for if m is not zero, like this. Okay, an implicit in this is that the limits all exist. Right? So if I really wanted to write this in its full excruciating detail, for number two, I would say the limit of f of x plus g of x exists and the limit uh, as x approaches c of f of x plus g of x is equal to l plus m. So really, in each of these, there are two statements happening, right? There's the statement that the limits exist, and it's what the limit is equal to. Okay, so it tells us two things, limit exists and what the limit is. And is anyone doing uh, linear algebra this term? No, I guess you, I guess if you're planning on taking 240, you would do it next one. Okay, but so some of you are. And uh, when you do linear algebra, have you ex like been taught about what um, um, abstract vector spaces are? Not yet. 
Okay. So when you get there, think about one and two. Okay. So one and one and two tell you that the uh, the collection of functions whose limit exists at a point C is a vector space, um, precisely because of this theorem, right? So one and two are precisely the things that you need for that uh, to hold. Okay. So now I imagine, like I said, a bunch of you have probably seen this before, right? Um, I think now is probably a good time to take a break. What I would like you all to do, though. Yeah, that's right. Uh, what I'd like you all to try and do is prove number one, okay? And I'll prove two and three for you, and I'll leave four as an exercise. Four is not that bad. Three is the hardest one. So I want you to prove one, because one is fairly straightforward. Um, and again, think about what it is that you're trying to do. You know that the limit of f of x is equal to L, right? So you've got this new function, which is alpha times f of x, and you want to show that it converges to alpha times L. This one is should only be about one liner. Uh, if you don't get it, that's fine, right? We're still figuring out how to do these things. But prove number one, uh, and then when we come back, like I'm actually not going to prove it, but you know you want to try it yourself. And again, the answer is in the books and everything. And then I'll prove two and three for us. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. So let's take a ten minute break here because I don't want to start the proofs of these things yet. Uh, so I've got nine fifty eight or so on my clock. So uh, 10.08 is when I think we can come back uh, or just in 10 minutes or so. Okay, everyone. And again, if you have any questions, throw them in the chat. Like I said, try and try and do this problem. And then uh, if you're still struggling, like I'll happily uh, answer any questions in the chat. I should be around. Uh, why can't I get stupid thing? There we go. So I can pause the recording. Ah, perfect. Recording. Now, hopefully, that made some progress. Stephen kind of gave away some an, uh, an important point in the chat. So you should basically get down to alpha f of x minus alpha l, and you can factor out the alpha there. Remember to put the absolute values on the alpha, though, just because in particular, what you're going to need to do is to uh, take epsilon to be uh, epsilon over the absolute value of alpha. And of course, you need that to be positive. So you need the absolute value there, right, in order to make everything work. But Right, you can walk through it without too much trouble. Um, for number two, we're going to do something very similar. So for number two, what we're going to do is we're going to say the following. So again, we know that the limits of f and g both exist. Uh, so in particular, if I fix an epsilon, and I'm trying to prove something about their sum, right? So again, we're going to fix an epsilon greater than zero. And I'm going to choose the delta, which works for both f and g. And pick delta f and delta g greater than 0, so that. OK, I'm going to name these equations here. So 0 is less than x minus c is less than delta f implies f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Let's call that, I'm going to call that equation one. Okay. And then same sort of thing for delta g, right? We have exactly the same thing is true. But, you know, obviously I have to make appropriate changes. g of x minus m is less than epsilon. And again, I'm going to do epsilon over two. Uh, I'm going to do epsilon over two because I know that I'm going to end up adding these things. But again, if you don't know that at this point, that's totally fine. Same sort of thing when you're doing rough work, you don't know any better. That's okay, right? Just keep it as epsilon and figure out uh, it later. And if you prove two epsilon, it's totally okay. Now, so again, I can assume that these are true because according to the theorem statement way up here, I know that the limits exist, right? F of X approaches L, G of X approaches M. And so I am allowed to feed it an epsilon, in this case, an epsilon over two, and I get back a delta F and a delta G, which makes these equations true. But I need them both to be true at the same time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose delta, which is the thing that's going to work for the sum of F plus G. That's going to be the minimum of delta F and delta G. All right, so we're going to set delta 
to be the min of delta f and delta g. So that, right, and you might say like, why are you choosing the min? And the reason why is that if I'm less than delta, then I'm less than both delta f and delta g, right? So if I'm less than delta, then I'm both less than both delta f and delta g, and therefore equation one and equation two are both simultaneously true. Right, then both one and two are true. So now we're really leveraging this fact that if you know a delta uh, works, any smaller delta will work as well, right? So if delta F and delta G, one of them is probably smaller than the other, that's fine. Choose the smaller one. It will still work for the other function as well, right? Okay, and now what I'm going to do, so suppose that, uh, you know, we have X minus C is less than delta. So thus suppose that zero is less than X minus C is less than Delta. Let's work on our F of X minus L, but in that case, that's actually F of X plus G of X minus L plus M. And I think in this case, I've done enough work that you might have forgotten what it is we're trying to prove. So let me just zoom out a little bit here. And let's go back, right? I'm proving number two. What are we trying to show? We're trying to show that the limit of f of x plus g of x is equal to l plus m. So the function here is f plus g, and the limit is l plus m, right? That's why I'm subtracting these two things, because that's what I'm trying to show, right? So hopefully that makes sense, and, and now it's refreshed in your brains in case we forgot what it is we were trying to do. Uh, and there's a very natural way in which we can rewrite this, right? I'm going to combine the F and the L together. And I'm going to put the G and the M together. And then we're going to use our nice little triangle inequality. F of X minus L. G of X minus M. And look at that. Both of these things, less than epsilon over 2, right? Because it, it, I said equation 1 and 2 both hold. and that's exactly our epsilon over two statement in both cases. And that gives me epsilon as I want it, right? So what have I shown? I've shown that f of x plus g of x minus L plus M is less than epsilon. And that's exactly what it means for the limit of f plus g to be L plus M, right? So it required a little bit of work because I had to like synthesize and combine information about f and g into one, but we managed to do it, right? Yeah, it works out pretty nicely. Right now, the the product is so much worse. Uh, the the you know the sum of two functions working out works out really nicely, precisely because everything just pairs up really really well. And then with the triangle inequality, you can split things uh, into exactly what you want them to be. Uh, the product is much meaner, but is is still similar. It just requires a little bit of a trick, right? So I'm going to show you the product now. And again, like I said, the, the uh, quotient, the f of x divided by g of x, that one's actually not too bad. So definitely do that one uh, on your own as practice and to make sure and see you can do it. It doesn't require any crazy tricks, at least nothing worse than what we're about to do in, in three here. Okay, So this is for the product. right? And maybe let me just say we want to show, let me just write it down again here because we're far enough away from the original theorem that we could use a little reminder on the screen. So we want to show that the limit as x approaches c, f of x, g of x is equal to L times m. OK, so uh, let me see. What do we want? I'm going to have to blah, 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 blah. OK, so this is going to look. Uh, I might rough work this one because if I write this one as a full proof to begin with, I think everyone's going to be like, I don't understand why you did any of that stuff. Okay. So I'm going to rough work this one so you can see what steps we're going to take uh, when we do them. So again, I'm just going to declare that this is rough. So let's start by taking my function and subtracting my limit, right? So I'm going to do f of x g of x 
minus Lm like that. And you see immediately, this isn't gonna work out as nicely as it did for the sum, right? Because I can't just immediately split it. But there is a common technique here, which occurs anytime you have something like this. And does anyone know what it is? It's a very common trick to use and uh, you know, it doesn't come up a crazy amount, but it is, it is important enough that having it in your brain toolbox is very, very useful. You know, this may, maybe this is the first time you've ever seen it, in which case you certainly haven't had it yet, but I'm gonna put it in your brains right now. Exactly, exactly. So add and subtract, and you've called it the halfway product. I like to call it the cross term. So basically I know that F of X pairs with L, and g of x pairs with m. But Anika, exactly what we're going to do is we're going to add and subtract a cross, what I call a cross term, right? So minus, let's say f of x. Uh, actually, just let me double check what I used uh, when I worked it out. Oh, I actually did g of xl. It doesn't matter, but. OK. So what I mean by cross term here, so notice we just added zero, but what I mean by cross term is we know that F pairs with L and G pairs with M. So this cross term is me pairing the, you know, one of the things on the left with its opposing thing on the right. So I'm not uh, pairing G with M, I'm actually pairing G with L. Does that make sense, right? Like what I mean by cross terms, right? Like in my brain, I've kind of got like F of X and L, I've got G of X and M. And so I'm doing, I'm multiplying the cross term, right? So these normally pair with each other and I'm gonna multiply the cross term. And what that's going to allow me to do, hopefully you can see it, is now I can actually split this up, All right? So I can factor a G of X out of the first thing. I'm gonna use square brackets here, F of X minus L. That's great, that's a good sign, right? Because I've got that F of X minus L, I know something about that. Uh, I can factor an L out of the second thing. Uh, so that's gonna give me G, oh, G of X minus M. And now I can triangle inequality. like so, okay? So this is, this is not a problem. There's still another trick that we're gonna have to do here, but in terms of our rough work, this is no problem. So this says, you know, take, you know, we're gonna wanna set the absolute value of G of X minus M to be less than or equal to epsilon over L, maybe two L, right? If you're, again, if you really wanna be, kind of anal about it, I would divide by two times the absolute value of L so that this becomes an epsilon over two. Again, it's not a big deal if you even leave the absolute value of L there because it's a constant and so it can stay. As long as the number in front of the epsilon is a constant, we don't care. Here though, we're in trouble. I can't do epsilon divided by the absolute value of G of X. That doesn't make any sense. And it's going to change as X changes. So what I need to do is I need to bound G, right? Now, there's a bunch of ways that you can do this, but we don't need to make life harder than it is. And why? What do we know? What did we prove earlier in this lecture? Can anyone think of it? We proved that if the limit of a function exists, exactly, it's locally bounded, right? Which means that since g of x approaches m, we know there's some neighborhood on which m is bounded. So we can just replace that with whatever the bound is, right? But we know that G is locally bounded, right? So we're just gonna replace G with whatever uh, its bound is. 
and then we're going to let f of x minus l be less than uh, that that bound. Okay. Now the only little trick here is that the delta g that I choose. I need to make sure also lives within um, the, the local bounding neighborhood, right? So that just means that I'm going to have to take the min of the two of them, but that's fine. So uh, as a proper proof, okay, let me uh, refer to this work as star so I don't have to repeat it. So as the proper proof, I said normally I wouldn't do the proofs for you, but I think this, this proof is like there's so much going on here, right? Um, and oh, sorry, Mahmoud, I actually only saw Yvonne's thing, but you responded earlier than that. But yeah, exactly. You said exactly the right thing as well. Okay, so the proof itself proper goes something like this. So uh, since uh, the limit as x approaches c, g of x equals m, we know that g is locally bounded. And you might say, okay, well, we didn't assume that G exists here, but again, in practice, we actually don't need it because again, we're gonna take, we, we're not actually working in the open uh, interval for this. We're actually just working in the deleted open interval. And so it's okay that G doesn't exist. It's still bounded from C minus rho union uh, or C minus rho C union C to C plus rho, right? Uh, we know it's locally bounded. So fix, uh, I need a different number other than M now. Let's do N. Right, so fix rho greater than zero such that uh, right, and so again, because I, I can't. Uh, the, the theorem doesn't say anything about G existing at C. In this case, I am using the version of the theorem above, but I'm only assuming that I'm bounded on the deleted open interval, right? So that's why I've written it like this. Okay, uh, so now we're gonna say pick, uh, so fix, or let's say choose delta F and delta G greater than zero, so that, zero is less than x minus c less than delta f implies f of x minus l is less than epsilon over n, right? And that's the same n from the boundingness of g. And maybe let's, and well, less than, again, let's call that equation one. Delta g implies g of x minus m is less than epsilon divided by the absolute value of L, right? And now I'm gonna take the min of not only delta F and delta G, but I also need the bound on the absolute value of G of X to be true. So I'm gonna throw rho into there as well. So set delta to be the min. I guess maybe let me call this equation zero because I stupidly started numbering uh, after that, but that's okay, right? doesn't matter what you call it. Delta F, Delta G, and Rho, so that zero, one, and two are all true. Hence, if uh, zero is less than X minus C is less than Delta, then from the work that we did above in rough work, we know that f of x, g of x minus l m is less than or equal to, uh, what was this, the absolute value of g of x, f of x minus l. I guess this should be 2n and 2 times the absolute value of l. Sorry. Again, just me being kind of anal like that. Right? So that, that, that's just equation star. And now I know that g of x is less than n, f of x minus l is less than epsilon over 2n, and g of x minus m is less than epsilon over 2l. So if I plug all that in, I'm going to get less than n times epsilon over 2 times n plus the absolute value of l times epsilon over 2 times the absolute value of l 
that's epsilon over two plus epsilon over two, which is equal to epsilon, voila, I'm done. All right, and let me, So yeah, I think this is what I say. I think if I went straight to that proof, people would have been, I mean, as it is, you might be like, oh man, my brain really hurts and I don't really understood what went on there. And that's okay. Uh, like I said, this is definitely sort of the trickier one, but uh, I think if I went straight to the proof, it would have been worse, right? You'd have been just like, wait a second, what are you, what are you doing? And how would you even know to do those things? And as always, it's because, <laughs> and as always, it's because uh, I had done the, the rough work ahead of time. Now, if you want, what you can do is, again, you can look at how, for example, Spivak proves this, or you could look up proof of the product limit law online. And what people do, what I think most people do in this case is they do exactly the same thing, but they bound the absolute value of G of X on the fly. So they say, uh, which, which ends up with them doing a weird, uh, thing right here. Okay, so it's both Spivak, and when you look at most sources online, they'll put a weird like min in the epsilon uh, definition, which you can do. Uh, I just don't think that's as clean as using a theorem we already know. Uh, right, okay, so why is it less than the row part? So for the row part, I also need this to be true, this equation zero, right? Because I use that right here. So I need to make sure that all three conditions, all three equations are true, right? And the only way to do that is to guarantee I'm less than rho as well. Okay, is everyone okay with that? Hopefully that didn't hurt too much. This is a little bit more on the sophisticated side. I, I wouldn't necessarily expect you to be able to, you know, just, you come up with this in a couple of minutes. Um, but I do think that if you spent enough time, like if I made this a homework problem and gave you a week to work on it, I think you could do it, right? Uh, but I don't think it's something you could just uh, get out immediately, right? It, it's not that uh, straightforward. Yeah, exactly. If delta works, then any value less than delta also works, exactly. How would question two from A1 compare in terms of difficulty? Uh, I need to remember what exactly I asked you. Uh, oh, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, question two from A1. I don't know. They're just totally different beasts, right? Like one is really a set theoretic proof and one is an, an, an analysis proof. So I claim that with, with question two from assignment one, you kind of had to be not clever, but again, if you hopefully did it when the case when A was finite, and you began, began to see a pattern, and then you hopefully cleverly realized how those two things were related. Here, there's no cleverness. Here, I insist that if you had started from your rough work, right, I think you all would have started with your rough work, and then maybe you got stuck at the cross term, and so I had to ask me for help, and I tell you, you know, add and subtract the cross term, that you all could get equation star. And then from equation star, it's just figuring out what do you do with the absolute value of g of x. So, to my mind, there's two obstacles to doing this problem as an assignment problem. One is realizing you have to multiply the cross term, g of x uh, times L, and two, figuring out what to do with the absolute value of g of x. But I claim that with enough time, most of you could have figured that out. The, the cross term is a little bit tricky. I might have given it as a hint. And so if the only problem here is now bounding the absolute value of g of x, I think most of you could do that. And it's not that hard. It just requires a little bit of thinking, right? So in some sense, this is maybe actually an even easier question than uh, as, uh, question two from assignment one, right? It's just you have to get used to these sorts of arguments, right? This is what analysis is. Yeah, but this is what analysis is, right? It's all about bounding and doing inequalities. Inequalities are hard, 100%. I used to teach Math 102 uh, a bunch back in the day, and something I would write down that like students would always get so upset about would be, would be uh, me writing this down, right? That x squared plus one is greater than or equal to one. And, right, and this is in some sense very clear, x squared is always greater than or equal to zero. So the number on the left is always greater than or equal to one, but inequalities don't behave like 
uh, equalities, right? Equalities are very rigid. The two things on the left-hand side have to be equal. Inequalities are very flexible, right? Because if I wrote this, students would also get upset, right? Like, why is it bigger than zero? How do you know that? Well, everything on the left-hand side is like non-negative. Obviously, it has to be bigger than zero. Inequalities are tough, right? Creating these bounding arguments is hard. It's part of the reason why I hate analysis. And I know that seems ironic because I'm teaching both the first and second year analysis courses, but I hate analysis because it's all inequalities. Um, if this stuff is not immediate to you, that's okay. You're going to get comfortable with it and you have to get comfortable with it to a certain extent if you want to do any serious higher level mathematics. But uh, yeah, that's, that's analysis. It's all inequalities, right? So we're going to get very, very good at doing these sorts of bounding arguments. Okay. So that's, that's what we get from that. Now I'm gonna leave this as you know, something for you to do as a little exercise. Or actually, sorry, let me make a, a, let me make a comment here first. Um, and the comment I wanna make is, uh, note, we assumed to begin with that both limits existed and we needed that for the proof, right? So the theorem, And proofs required that the limits exist, right? Because all the time, what we'll get in like 135, 136, and in some cases, these higher level courses, yeah, oh yeah, well, uh, that the limit, no, 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 yeah, no, no, no. There's, there's two different things here. So we are assuming, oh man, we have to go up so high. I'm assuming that these limits exist, right? Now, by virtue of my proof, I've also proven that the limit of F plus G or the limit of F times G exists, right? Because I, I had a candidate limit and I showed that it satisfied the epsilon delta definition. So I didn't assume they existed. I actually did prove they did exist, but I had to assume that the limit of F and the limit of G existed to, in order to be able to use these, right? So that's kind of the important thing there because what you'll often see, 135 students do this all the time. It's very infuriating. Uh, you'll ask students to do this. Right, and they'll do this. And they say, oh, well, this thing's equal to zero. So this is just zero times the limit as x approaches zero, sine one over x. And you get zero, right? Now, here's the thing. Uh, by showing that the limit is ln, we also prove, exactly, exactly, yeah. We, we prove the limit exists. So here's the thing. Zero is the right answer here. Uh, but when a student does this, they get like zero on the question. And uh, they come back and they will get upset and they'll be like, well, you know, I got the right answer. Why don't I get full marks? And we say, well, you, what you did was total nonsense. You can't, you can't do this sort of thing, um, right? Like you, you got it by luck. You didn't get it because you actually did the right thing. Here's maybe a more, uh, more obvious example. So here's, or maybe it's like a stupid example. So if I gave you this, I think most of you would agree the limit of this thing is one because the you know x divided by x is the function which is constantly one. This function is not defined at zero, but who cares? Everywhere else it's equal to one, right? So this limit is clearly equal to one. But if you were to falsely use the limit laws, so here's a case where if you use the limit laws, you actually get the wrong answer. Again, that thing on the left is equal to zero. So you would get zero uh, times this limit. And then you would say, well, who cares what this limit is? The answer is zero. And now you, yeah, exactly. So now you clearly get the wrong answer, right? Um, so, well, okay. So Jianjin, the, the fact that sine is bounded, we're gonna need a theorem to deal with that, right? It's the squeeze theorem. You can't just say that because your function is bounded, this is automatically true. Um, so for example, I, I could break that in such a way that the function goes to zero, but exactly in a way that counteracts uh, 
um, uh, an oscillation of a function that I give you. So it's not just enough to say that it's bounded. You have to be a little bit more careful than that. But that's the rough idea is that the boundedness of sign will basically allow you to make this argument. You'd still have to prove it though, right? And then exactly, uh, Yuanji, I think you kind of pick up in this problem here is that the limit of one over X goes to infinity. So if X goes to zero and one over X goes to infinity, they can actually cancel each other out and arrive at a finite answer, like the number one, right? Which we said we know is the limit. So something going to zero and then something getting very, very big can have a, um, a modulating factor on one another or a mitigating factor, right? They can like uh, temper each other out to ensure that neither of those extremes actually happens. So we have to be very careful about that, right? The, the wrong step in both of these cases is applying the limit law. And we can't apply these limit laws, right? Because in each of these cases, one of those limits doesn't exist. So I don't expect too many 157 students to make this mistake, but it's it's something that's worth pointing out because it is sort of a very tempting thing to do, um, but you can't, right? The limit laws say you have to know that both limits exist. Sine one over X, that limit doesn't exist. One over X, that limit doesn't exist either. So you can't use the limit laws here, okay? So just really, really be careful about that. You don't wanna make that mistake. Okay, so that's comment number one. Now, comment number two, which I'm not going to prove, but if you want like to work on your induction a little bit, you want to like see, oh, hey, can uh, how comfortable am I with induction? Uh, here's a little exercise for you. So basically show that these uh, extend to any finite number. So we said the limit of F plus G is uh, the limit of f plus the limit of g, show that the limit of f1 plus dot 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 fm is the sum of the limits, right? So suppose Okay, so what I'm saying here is suppose that you have n functions and you know that all of their limits exist. So show, I'm going to use sigma notation here. I hope you're all okay with it, but you know, if not, you can yell at me. Uh, and if not, we're going to use sigma notation a lot later, so you might want to review it. So show that one, the limit as x approaches c of the sum i equals one to m. Okay, so inductively, Right, you're saying we're saying that uh, yeah, this applies to uh, any finite sum, right? Uh, not an infinite sum. We can't say anything about infinite sums, but we can say something about finite sums. This proof is a relatively straightforward induction proof. The base case is done. The base case is the limit laws, and so induction hypothesis assume that it holds for a sum of n numbers. Show that it holds for a sum of n plus one numbers. Basically, you revert back to the base case again, right? Same sort of thing. And for two, now I don't know, I assume most of you have seen sigma notation. You might not have seen pi notation, but uh, pi notation is the same thing as sigma notation, but instead of adding, you're multiplying, right? So this pi, this weird kind of crazy pi thing is F1 times F2 times F3 times F4 all the way up to Fn. Okay. Base case is three. No, base case is two. Yeah. Um, like you've, we've already proven it for two, right? So you might as well start at n is equal to two and let that be the base case. The sum, so the first one is like a sum of all the values contained in the second. Yes. Yeah. 
Exactly. So the first one is the sum of all of the values, and the second one is the product of all the values. Exactly. OK? And if you don't want to use sigma and product notation, you don't have to. You can just write it out as f1 plus f2 plus dot, dot, dot plus fn. If you want to do something like that, you can. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's sigma notation, and that's kind of how it's written out. Yeah. So, and again, this, this notation, I think, is reviewed in the chapter one. I Maybe it's, I can't remember whether I reviewed sigma notation in chapter one of my book, but uh, go check it out, see if it is in there, because it is, uh, right, I did put it on the, uh, on Quirkus, so you can go and take a look at it if you don't remember how this stuff works. We're going to use it a ton, when, especially when we get to integrals. So even if you don't know it now, you'll probably want to over the December break, make sure you're comfortable with it because we're gonna use it a lot, right? So you have to be really kind of on the ball with it. Um, but that's just something to keep in mind. Oh, and I guess one more thing. And uh, three, the limit as X approaches C, let's just use F of X here. I know I didn't define F of X, but it's just one of the functions. Uh, maybe let me use a different number other than n. Use m. Right? And so an immediate corollary of property number two is that if all the functions are the same, the limit of the exponent of f is the exponent of the limit, of the limit, right? So in number two, just let f1 be equal to f2 be equal to f3. Uh, and then an immediate consequence of this is property number three. Now, the reason why I bring this up is that one, two, and three all combined immediately tell us the following. So if P is a polynomial, Some people, just if you kind of want to know notationally how you write P as a polynomial, you'd say this, right? Like I'm not gonna, I probably won't use this notation too much, but this says that P is a polynomial whose coefficients are real numbers, right? So if P is a polynomial, then the limit of p of x is just p of c. Right, for those of you who remember or have seen continuity before, you will recognize this as the statement that every polynomial is everywhere continuous, right? And I guess I should say this is true for all c. Proof of this fact now follows immediately from what we've just proven. Right, we could say write our polynomial as the sum from k equals zero to n, a k x to the k, right? So every polynomial looks like this, right? A naught plus a one x plus a two x squared, et cetera. And then all we do is we apply the limit laws. So we know, and I guess I should say, uh, and remember, that the limit as x approaches c of x is equal to c. OK, I'm not going to prove this. If you haven't proven that the limit of x is equal to c, do that, it's very, very quick, right? Very, very quick proof. Uh, it's so quick, there's almost nothing to do. Uh, but if you haven't done it, just do it once just to convince yourself that it's true, right? So thus, I mean, actually, if you did the ax plus b exercise, obviously, this is an example of a linear function and you've already done it, right? Uh, but if not, again, just write it out. It, it's very, very fast. So thus, And hopefully you see what's going to happen. What are polynomials? Well, polynomials are just made of a bunch of additions, 
multiplication by real numbers and exponentiation of x's, right? So all we're going to do is we're just going to really leverage the fact that our limit laws tell us exactly what to do. Okay, so uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the limit inside the sum, right? That's property number two of the limit laws. All right, so this here, this is number one of the limit, or sorry, number two of the limit laws. Uh, then I'm going to factor out the AK. That's number one. And then uh, I can like take the exponent out, right? That's basically the product rule. But the inductive product rule that we were talking about before. And, you know, I'm kind of, I'm doing this in painful detail. Obviously, I think, uh, hopefully at this point, many of you see that it's going to work, but I'm doing it in painful detail. So this is really the product one. And so we've used everything except uh, the division one, but who cares? And yeah, that is actually P of C, right? So if you took our original polynomial and plugged C into it, that is what you would get. So here's our kind of like first uh, computational assistant is yeah, if you want to, if you if I give you a polynomial, you want to figure out what its lemma you or what its limit is. You have a proposition saying you don't have to do all that epsilon delta crap. You can just say that the limit is equal to P of C because we now have a proposition that we proved with the limit laws saying that yeah, the limit of P of X as X approaches C is P of C, no epsilon delta required, right? So we've built up, right? We're building. We have this foundation. And we're slowly building up results until we can say something like this and make our lives a little bit easier. Okay. And as an immediate corollary to this, we also have that all rational functions, as long as the denominator is not zero. All right. So if P and Q are polynomials, and Q of C is not zero, and now here's us using the division uh, limit law, right? And I'm not even going to prove this because there's nothing to prove. You already know from the previous proposition, both of these things are polynomials, so their limits are both just, you can plug them in. And then the division limit law says, well, as long as the denominator is not zero, then you can divide the limits. Um, and so the combination of those two things means this is done. There's nothing to prove. OK, so any questions? Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do, I, I don't know if I'm going to have time to prove this, but maybe we will. And you, uh, I, again, I'm certain, again, if you've done calculus before, you've seen this theorem before, you might have called it something else. So this is the squeeze theorem. I think I've heard it called the Sandwich theorem. I've heard it called the cops and robbers theorem. And I've, uh, what else? There's at least one other one out there. If you have a different name, if you've heard of a different name for it, throw it in the chat so I can see it. A police escorting a drunk guy home shirt. Yeah, pinch theorem, exactly. Yeah, I forgot about that one, Sophia, but absolutely. Uh, so suppose FG and H map D to R uh, and 
f of x less than or equal to g of x less than or equal to h of x for all x in D. Uh, if the limit as x approaches c f of x is equal to L is equal to x. <laughs> then the limit as x approaches c of g of x equals l, like so. Yeah, yeah, OK. So uh, again, two things. Uh, implicit in the theorem statement is that the limit g exists and is equal to l. OK, so once again, kind of implicit here. is that the limit exists. So once again, I'm not assuming that the limit exists. We're going to prove that it exists. But by virtue of that, we're also going to prove that its limit is equal to, to what it should be, right? It's equal to L. All right, I actually probably do have time to prove this. So uh, why don't I do that? And again, I think we can be motivated by a little bit of geometric intuition as to what's happening here. So uh, let's suppose, you know, here's our function f of x. And here is our function g of x. Or sorry, h of x. Let's let this be h of x. And then g of x is some function, and it always lives between these two. Who knows what it does? But because it always lives between these two, and we know that f and g both in this case pinch together or squeeze together, right? They have the same limit at the point C. Let's maybe clearly indicate that this here, this is the point C, right? And the height of that is L, that uh, the function G of X is also gonna have to have the same limit, right? Oh, damn it, I've got my F's and my H's backwards, don't I? All right, F is the smaller function and h was the bigger function. OK? Prove this is actually really easy. It's surprising how easy this one is. But it's a little bit weird because in the proof, um, usually, like in all the proofs that we've done so far when we were doing the limit laws and everything, uh, we used you know, the absolute value of f of x minus l and the absolute value of g of x minus m or whatever the case might be. And we use both sides of that, right? The absolute value has kind of an implicit upper and lower bound in the epsilon delta or in the epsilon band. But in this proof, we're actually only going to use that. Maybe you can see it. We're going to use the top half of the band for h. and We're going to use the bottom half of the band uh, for f. And that combined is going to give us the epsilon band for g. Right? So we're going to take an epsilon band around f, but we're only going to use its bottom half. We're going to take an epsilon band for h, but we're only going to use its upper half. And then we're going to combine those to form an epsilon band for g. All right, so that's basically how the proof goes. All right, so let epsilon greater than 0 be given. And let's choose delta f and delta h greater than zero, such that blah, 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 the usual thing, right? So such that uh, zero less than x minus c less than delta f implies that f of x minus l is less than epsilon. And uh, I'm going to rewrite this. Okay, I'm going to rewrite this as L minus epsilon is less than F of X is less than L plus epsilon. Okay, those are the same thing, but I'm just going to rewrite it like that because that's how I'm going to use it. I said I'm only going to use each half of the epsilon bands. All right, so that's equation one. Okay, uh, delta H. And remember, H has the same limit here. That's going to be important.
Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this half, right? This is what I meant by I'm going to take the lower bound, the lower part of the epsilon bound for F, and I'm going to take the upper part of the epsilon band for H, right? So uh, set delta to be the min, as usual, of delta F and delta H. So if zero is less than X minus C is less than delta. So both one and two are true. Uh, and so we're gonna get L minus epsilon is less than F of X. And now here I use the last piece of information Right, there, those are those two halves of the epsilon band I used. And basically what I do now is I say, forget about F and, and H. What have I just shown? I've shown that L minus epsilon is less than G of X is less than L plus epsilon or equivalently, G of X minus L is less than epsilon. And that's what I wanted to show, right? Try and give you the whole picture there. So again, it ends up working out very nicely. Uh, this is one of those things that if you if you tried to prove it, and you tried to prove it with the absolute values intact, it actually surprisingly would have been quite tough. And the answer, the trick is you actually have to unravel the epsilon deltas because in order to make the chain of inequalities work in that second to last line. In order to make that chain of inequalities work, you just need the lower half of F's epsilon band and the upper, halves, upper half of H's epsilon band. And this is why we can't just symbol push, right? We can't just, you know, and especially from the limit laws, you might say, okay, well, listen, why don't I just take the function minus its limit and do some algebraic manipulation and hope that I get something I can work with. Sometimes you actually have to have an intuitive understanding of how uh, these epsilon delta proofs work so that you know, in this case, that yeah, you only want half of each epsilon band, right? Did we not have to account for jump discontinuity when choosing delta because we know that G of X is continuous? We don't know that G of X is continuous. We don't know anything about G. Um, whether F, yeah, so we don't know, we don't know whether F of C, H of C, or G of C is defined, right? Like we don't know anything about the values of the functions at the limiting point, uh, but the limit doesn't care about those. So if we look at the theorem statement, it says, you know that the limit of F and the limit of H are both equal to L. You don't know anything about the values of their functions at their points, but you don't care. And when we're doing the limit of G, same sort of thing. We don't care about G of C, right? G of C could do whatever it wants. It might not be defined. It could be some sort of removable discontinuity. It could be you know, off somewhere else. Um, we don't care because the limit never cares about what happens at the point C itself, right? So even though really terrible things could happen, uh, we don't care about what happens at the point C. Okay, everyone. Um, so I know that was a lot of theorems, a lot of proofs in a, in a very short order. Um, if I had to leave you with a little exercise, again, just something else to try proving. This is pretty, this isn't too hard. So use the squeeze theorem to do this. So show that the limit of the absolute value of f of x is equal to zero if and only if f of x in the limit is zero, okay? This doesn't work for any other number other than zero. You can't generally prescribe any information about the absolute value of f of x if and only if f of x. If you know f of x, you can figure out its absolute value, but you generally can't go the other way around, except when the value is zero. One direction here is very quick. The other direction definitely helps if you have the squeeze theorem. Okay, so here's kind of like a nice little theorem uh, that will come up very useful for us, and you can try and prove it if uh, you just want to work on your squeeze theorem things. Okay, otherwise, everyone, I think that we're done here. Um, 
I, I think the marking is supposed to be done for Friday in terms of the term test. So I'll see you even before the marking is done. But yeah, you can expect to have those marks sent out sometime then. And otherwise, I will see you uh, on Thursday. All right. So have a good Wednesday and I'll see you uh, in a couple of days. Let me just stop the recording.